evening and thank you for joining us. Just over three years ago, the Siegel JCC and Jewish Family Services of Delaware came together to help our community heal from a loss by suicide of one of our own. We created a forum, the Wellness Summit, to share grief, learn the impact of mental health and find ways to cope as a community. Our resolve in 2020 to strengthen our community provide you resources and help you thrive is stronger than ever. We are grateful that you have joined this session tonight, holding on to hope, suicide prevention during challenging times. My name is Rosie Crosby and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at JFS Delaware, and I will be your moderator for this evening's program. Please feel free to type in questions by clicking on the Q&A icon. The chat feature has been disabled for this webinar. We will try to answer as many of your questions as possible with the time we have together, but if we are unable to get to them, we will post them after the summit concludes. Please help me welcome Jennifer Smolowitz, Project Director for Suicide Prevention at the Mental Health Association in Delaware. MHA and Jen have been involved with our Wellness Summit since its inception. Jen motivates me to learn more, helps me to understand the impact of mental health on our lives, and most importantly, she shares her wisdom humbly and generously. Thanks, Jen, for joining us. Please begin. Thank you, Rosie. Okay. Um, as I'm getting this set up, I just want to thank Rosie and the entire Wellness Summit Committee for having me this evening. Um, I really wish I could be with you all in person because I know that when we talk about suicide and suicide prevention, it's so important for that connection. Um, but I will do my best to bring that information to you virtually. Just give me one second, apologize. Um, again, as I'm getting started, I just wanted to give a little bit more information about MHJ just very briefly. We are a statewide organization that focuses on education, advocacy, and support um, for mental health and suicide prevention. As reg in regards to support, we offer a variety of wellness groups. We also offer educational opportunities for both um, mental health and suicide prevention, as I mentioned. And then we do a lot of adv advocacy and sharing of resources and working with other agencies, including JFS and the JCC. So tonight, as I mentioned, we'll be talking about um, holding on to hope and how to really focus in on suicide prevention during these challenging times. Um, we will be going over some of the characteristics of suicide that are common to most that are common to most suicides. We'll be discussing some of the myths and facts, spending a good amount of time talking about the warning signs, because especially while we can't all be together in person, knowing what, what to look for as we talk to each other and our loved ones on the phone or via Zoom or FaceTime, what signs to pick up on. But I didn't wanna leave you with that, knowing what the warning signs are and then not knowing what to do. So we're gonna follow it up with how to help, spend a little bit of time talking about the language that's associated with suicide and suicide prevention and how stigma can sometimes play a role. And then we'll end with a discussion talking about the impact that some of the current events that are going on all around us are having on suicide and suicide prevention. Um, so to get started, some of the characteristics that we see in a lot of suicides, not all, but in most of them, the first one is that it's an alternative to what's seen as unsolvable problem. So the person may be feeling overwhelmed, they may be feeling like there's no way out of the situation that they're in, and the only thing they can think of to make things better is to take their own life. Um, in this moment, they may know that they have loved ones that they're leaving behind, whether it's children, friends, parents, whoever that might be. But again, the problems that are occurring in the person's life or the problems that they think are occurring, suicide to them appears to be the only answer. Going along on that same page, the thinking's often in crisis mode. We see this a lot in um, youth as they tend to be more impulsive when it comes to talking and thinking about suicide, but there's that crisis mode. A problem may occur, the person doesn't know how to get out of it, doesn't know how to fix it, they don't see it other way out, they don't see another solution. So that thinking's in crisis mode, they think that in that moment, suicide might be the answer. Um, for many, it's considered to be mean, a means of communication. So a lot of times somebody will put out a warning sign and we'll talk again about those, whether they realize they're doing so or not. 
But in this moment, those attempts or talking openly about suicide or threatening suicide can really be a means of communication for um, somebody who may be at risk. And lastly, there's a sense of ambivalence. That person isn't fully committed to wanting to die by suicide, but they're also not fully committed to wanting to live. They just don't wanna feel how they're feeling anymore. And that could be a variety of ways. They could be in physical pain. They could be experiencing some type of mental pain, whatever it might be. In that moment, they don't wanna feel how they're feeling right now. So there's that, that tug of war, that pull between I wanna live and I don't wanna live. Um, and I thank Anna for sharing in the chat about um, reaching out with some resources and reaching out if you are in need of talking to somebody. And I just wanted to say before we continue um, that I really appreciate you all being here this evening. I know it's not an easy conversation, but it is a very important one. And taking in this information and being able to help a loved one or a stranger or a neighbor, whoever it might be, um, is really helpful. And you should all be applauded for taking the time out this evening to be a part of this. that. Um, as we move into talking about, sorry, talking about some of the myths and facts, um, it should be circling back. The first one is that it's dangerous to ask a depressed person whether they're considering suicide. And often we think, well, I don't know what that person's going through. I don't know if I should ask them. I feel like I should mind my own business. Suicide is probably the only thing where we don't have to mind our business. And in fact, we shouldn't. If there's somebody that you're worried about, somebody's talking about things that's giving you that bad goosebump feeling, you have to intervene. We can't just sit back and say, well, they'll talk to me if they want to. We have to reach forward and help them. Um, with talking about, is it dangerous? Often a person who's having thoughts of suicide may not realize that they have anybody to talk to. And they may not even realize that what they're thinking is suicide or is thoughts of suicide. So we wanna make sure that we are expressing to them that yes, it is okay to talk about it. It might be the first time that they're hearing the thoughts they're having laid out there. It might be the first time that they're saying, oh, this is what is being portrayed. That's not what I was thinking, but it's still a way to connect them with help. Um, again, it might be the first time the person's willing to talk about it. And you also might see a sense of relief when you talk openly with somebody about the thoughts that they might be having. They may feel like they've had to hold everything in and then if you ask them about it, it starts to build that connection and they feel that there's somebody they can talk to. The second one, that people who wanna die will always find a way. In some cases, there are people who are very determined and they will find a way to suicide, but that is not the common for everyone. Um, often when people are talking about suicide, the fact that they're still here and they haven't done it yet, we still have that chance to reach them. That's when they're in that ambivalent sense. So again, they're not fully committed to wanting to die, but they're also not fully committed to wanting to live. And we're able to help them, get them connected with the resources that we'll discuss, but we're able to help them to keep them feeling safe and keep them feeling safe around us. Um, people who take their own life, it tends to be out of the blue. There are some cases, I can't say that this never happens. There are some cases that we may have said, oh, we really didn't see that coming. But then when we think about it afterwards, we maybe there were some more warning signs that we saw, but we weren't aware that they were warning signs. Um, there are people who will say, my loved one left a note and I knew nothing about it. They even said that I wouldn't have seen it coming because some people are good at hiding it. Um, but more often than not, it doesn't come straight out of the blue. There's usually some type of warning sign, whether the person realizes they're putting it out there or not. But there's usually something that should give us that sense that something's off, something doesn't seem quite right. In regards to someone who has their act together isn't at risk of suicide, I think we see this a lot with famous people. We see people who have all the money in the world, all the opportunities, they're surrounded by loved ones. There's so much going on in their life and we think they have it all together. They have everything they want. But we know that those same people often struggle with mental illness and often struggle with thoughts of suicide or actually take their own lives in the end. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're seeing that it's not how somebody is on the outside but how they are on the inside. So even if everyone has it all together or appears to have it all together, finding out what's happening, what they're feeling about certain events. Um, I think it was a quote, I can't, I don't have the quote word for word, but Robin Williams once made a statement about sometimes people who have depression work so hard to make other people happy because they know what it's like to be sad. And again, I'm not quoting that word for word, but sometimes we're able to hide how we're feeling. So really, getting in there, finding out, hey, I know you have all this going on, but that could be really overwhelming as well. 
what's happening, what can I do to help you? Um, one of the biggest misconceptions around suicide is that it usually, again, I apologize for that, is that it usually happens um, around the winter holiday season. We actually see more suicides in the springtime. They tend to trend higher in the springtime. And a lot of that has to do with people getting more energy. Um, a reason that a lot of people think it's during the winter holiday season is because there's a lot of family togetherness that people might be missing their families or not having a family to hang to be with. Um, also, people may feel well with seasonal affective disorder or those winter blues that there's just a lot going on. Um, also, sometimes from the holiday season, there are a lot of financial stressors or other peer and social pressures, but we do see a higher trend in the springtime as opposed to the winter months. Um, the next one, when someone recovers after hitting rock bottom, the risk of suicide declines. I wish I could say that this was the case for everyone, that as soon as somebody starts to recover, we never have to worry about them again. That is the case for some people, but unfortunately not the case for everyone. Um, a lot of times somebody will finally get connected with a resource and you start to think that things are getting better and then they attempt suicide. And the reason for that is they get that little bit of energy. They get that little bit of strength that it takes to take their own life. And they start to say that they start to come to the realization that this is still something that they want to do, but they're able to now with the energy move forward with their attempt. That's why no matter if somebody's new in recovery or been recovered from their suicide attempt for years, we always want to make sure we're staying connected with them, connecting them with resources and having that ongoing conversation. Again, there are some people who will attempt suicide or talk about it once, get the help they need, and they never attempt or think about it again. But unfortunately, that is not the case for everyone. Um, and the last one, that giving somebody a hotline number to call is enough. In some cases, it is all that we can do, but we always want to take it one step further. Um, I will say that if you are giving somebody a number to call, please make sure that you're calling the number first and making sure it's still active. Um, most of the crisis lines still are up and running, but a lot of times some of the therapist office you might recommend or something like that, their hours will change or due to funding it may change or even due to COVID there, there might be certain restrictions in place. So just making sure that if you're giving somebody a number, you're calling the number and making sure it's still active. Also with this, it takes a lot of strength to reach out for help. It's not a weakness to not be able to make a phone call. It takes a lot of strength to say, I need help. I need somebody to help me. So if you can, calling on behalf of the person, not just giving them the number, but either calling with them there with you, calling with their permission. Um, if they're not ready to call yet, but you know that they're going to call, practicing how that conversation might go, practicing dialing the numbers, practicing talking with somebody on the crisis line and letting them know what resources they might discuss and what that process will look like. There are a lot of warning signs that we are gonna spend some time talking about, um, just again, because now more than ever, it's important to know what, um, it's important to know what to look out for. Again, we can't always be with the person physically, but we wanna make sure that as we're doing these interactive conversations and talking on the phone, we're able to pick up on some of those changes and some of those warning signs. About 80% of individuals, again, whether they realize it or not, will give out some type of warning sign. And that is why I wanted to spend quite some time discussing it this evening. Um, and a good way to remember what some of them are is with the term facts. And we're gonna start by talking about what some of those feelings might look like. Um, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them throughout and I'm happy to um, take them as we go. Um, the first feeling of a warning sign that we wanna look out for is if somebody's expressing hopelessness, they're feeling like things are so bad and they're never gonna get any better. Again, they don't see any other ways to solve the problem that they're facing. They don't see any other way out. So they feel like suicide's the only thing and they're ready to give up. Fear of losing control is another one. And that's something that a lot of people are seeing now as far as they're, they're losing control of their routines, they're losing control of their livelihoods, they're losing control of so many things that are out of their own control. So there's a lot of struggles that we're seeing that we'll discuss later on this evening. Um, you may see somebody harming himself or herself at this time as well. Not everyone who engages in that type of behavior has a desire to want to end their life, but sometimes it is a way of communication. It's a way of saying, I'm putting a physical pain to the emotional pain that I'm feeling. And I need to talk to somebody. 
So if you know somebody who's doing that, um, engaging any type of non-suicidal self-injury, we really wanna make sure we're looking out for them, figuring out what's going on and trying to get to the bottom of it. In this stage, you might see a lot of helplessness too. Again, the belief that there's nothing that can be done to make the person's life better. They don't necessarily wanna ask for help because they don't wanna feel like they're a burden to anybody. They don't wanna worry anybody. Um, sometimes they feel like their general presence is a burden. And you can tell the person as much as you want, no, 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 you're not, but sometimes they may still feel that way. So just trying to reassure them as much as possible. Here we also see a lot of worthlessness. They may feel a lot of shame, feel like they're not worthy of certain things they have in their life, um, feeling that they may not be worthy of opportunities or just having a friend like you or a family member like you in general. So again, if you're hearing somebody express those things that they're worthless or helpless, or they feel like they're in a black hole and they can't get their way out, we're gonna learn how to take it one step further and see how we can help them. During, the, during this time, you might see them engaging in any type of self-hate or negative self-talk, um, talking a lot, very negatively about the physical aspects of themselves, but also their uh, mental aspects, talking negatively about the work that they do, um, about the type of friend they are, the type of family member they are. So anytime you hear that self-doubt or that hate talk, that hate speech, we wanna make sure we're looking out for that as well. Um, during this time, you may see somebody express feelings of sadness and loneliness, and not necessarily a general loneliness that many of us are feeling right now, um, kind of being separated from people. But even if they're around people, they might not always be connecting, or they may feel like they don't fit in, or they may feel like if even in a crowded room, if they weren't there, would people even notice? So the, I always think of like a lunchroom example. If you see a kid sitting alone, trying to go up to them and just engaging them with a smile can really make a difference. Um, I know now it's hard to kind of see that smile in people with everyone wearing masks and it's a struggle, but I think the more that we can try to express connection in the ways that we can, the better it will be for everyone. Um, and lastly, under feelings, you might see a lot of anxiety or worry in the person, worried that they have too much going on, worried that they can't keep control of it, um, and really a desperation, a desperation to get things done, a desperation to feel better, a desperation for it all. Some of the actions that you might have somebody engage in, um, engaging in any type of alcohol or drug use. So this might be that they go from never engaging in it to trying it or their increase of alcohol and drugs increases over time. If they want to um, try to solve their problems with alcohol or drugs, that's definitely a huge red flag that we wanna look out for as well um, because engaging in any type of drug or alcohol use prevents you from getting help for the person um, on a verbal level and then we would have to get other resources involved. Another action would be openly talking or writing about death and destruction. Um, I always say when I'm working with teachers to pay attention to what the students are writing in their essays, what pictures they're drawing, um, but even with parents or with friends, whoever it might be, seeing what the person's liking and posting on social media. And it might not be something that they're posting themselves, but it might be a page or a group they belong to or a post that they like, because sometimes other people can put into words how we're feeling better than we can. So we might not be able to write a diary entry and have it be up there as a meme, but other people might. So it's not just what they're posting, but the things that they're liking, the group, again, that they belong to, um, the friends they have, that type of things are those things, those are the type of things that you wanna look out for just to make sure that we're not letting anything slip through the cracks. Um, if they're actively online looking for ways to kill themselves, that's a huge red flag. Um, with that, we wanna make sure, and you'll, well, I hope you never see, but when people would were to do a Google search or something of that nature, the crisis resources do come up, but if somebody's talking to you that they've done any type of searches like that in the past, you wanna make sure you're getting them connected with help immediately. Um, somebody who is having thoughts of suicide might be engaging in self-destructive behavior, reckless behavior, because they don't care what happens to them either way. So it might be somebody who's starting fights um, or engaging, getting in trouble with the law because they're not really caring about the outcome. So anytime they're acting, that, totally different than how you typically know them to be. We wanna make sure we're addressing that. And again, acting in any sort of recklessness, um, whether it's acting in aggressive behaviors or just acting reckless overall. Um, in regards to changes, 
One of the biggest ones we want to look out for is any type of personality or behavior change. And I always say, if the person's not acting the way you typically know them to be, you want to follow it up with them. Again, suicide is not something that we can mind our business about. If somebody's acting off to you, um, their, act, their, their actions are giving you that bad goosebump feeling. You want to make sure that you're engaging with them and finding out what's going on. Do they need somebody to talk to? Um, with this example, I always think of Eeyore and Tigger from Winnie the Pooh. And we often think that, um, hopefully everyone's familiar with them, but we have Eeyore who's kind of more withdrawn, um, pulled back, a little bit more negative talk. And then we have um, Tigger who's bouncing around, he's friends with everyone, he goes from group to group and everything seems fine. And often we think that if somebody goes from being outgoing like Tigger to being like Eeyore, that there's something wrong. But if they go from being like Eeyore to Tigger, everything seems better, everything is fixed. And in some cases that might be, but often people will show a sign of improvement right before a suicide attempt because they've come to terms with their decision. So again, any major personality change, whether it's happy to sad, sad to happy, withdrawn to engage, engaged to withdrawn, if they're not acting how you typically know them to be or how their friends typically know them to be, we wanna intermeet and get them help. Um, a person may show an inability to concentrate. They may be reading something and they get to the end of the page and they have no idea what they read. Or you might see changes in their work or their schoolwork or their grades, um, changes in how they connect as a friend. And this is more general, not specific to how we all are during COVID as far as um, our levels of engagement, but just any other time. Um, if they're not, if they typically are the ones that make plans and all of a sudden they're canceling plans at the last minute or they're not showing up altogether, finding out why that might be. Um, if they're behaving like a different person, like I said, becoming more withdrawn, they look tired, they're saying that they're tired all the time, maybe they're saying they're sleeping all the time, that's something to look out for as well. Changes in their eating patterns, either they're eating too much, not enough, not the right stuff, and kind of just giving up on their appearance, giving up on hygiene, giving up on their work, um, giving up on showing up on time, and just an overall sense of just giving up on things that once mattered to them. Here you might see changes in the friends that they have, the hobbies that they engage in. They might start to withdraw and pull back from that. So again, that's something we wanna look out for as well. Um, isolating themselves. So if they typically are the life of the party and now all of a sudden they wanna spend more time alone in their rooms, um, we wanna look for that. Trying to keep as many devices out of their rooms, especially if it's young kids, we wanna look out for that as well to make sure that they are having those face-to-face -face interactions they are having conversations with you, but knowing that they're not just spending their time online because we don't always know what's on there. And again, just a reminder that sudden improvement, even after a period of being withdrawn or sad, sometimes it does mean that the problems they were facing have been addressed and have gotten better and they are okay, but oftentimes they're not. So we still wanna make sure that we're following up with them. Um, as far as some of the threats we wanna look out for, maybe, um, as, as it goes back, some of the threats that we wanna look out for would be openly talking about suicide. I don't wanna be here anymore. Um, pretty soon I won't matter. Pretty soon I won't be a worry to you. Or I won't be a burden any longer. Um, talking about that everyone will be better off without me. I just can't do it anymore. Um, you see some others up there on the screen. I can't take it anymore. I wish I weren't here. Somebody openly having those conversations and openly expressing those thoughts, whether verbally or through their writing or their drawings or their artwork is something we wanna look out for. Jen, um, yeah. before we go any further, we have a question that I mm -hmm. thought would be appropriate to answer at this time. And the question is, is it ever too soon to talk about suicide? I don't think so. I think that um, for whoever asked the question, I think as far as an age, is it too soon or just too soon in a conversation? And I can address both of those. Um, as far as an age, we're unfortunately seeing kids as young as five and six years old talk about suicide. Not always the finality of it. They may not know what the word means, but they've heard the word before, whether through an older sibling, a kid on the bus, um, someone at school, um, through some type of media, they've seen it, they've heard it. So again, they may not know the finality, but they know that it's something that out, that's out there. So I think the earlier we can have these conversations with kids, 
um, as they're growing up and just make it a regular part of conversations, a regular part of growing up, like we would have other, um, while we would discuss other topics can be crucial. The more we normalize it in the sense that everyone has emotions and it's okay to express those emotions, the more we make talking about mental health and talking about suicide common, the more open people will hopefully feel about expressing it and getting the help that they need before those problems go out of control. Um, and as far as, is it too soon if you're worried about somebody? I don't think it's ever too soon. I think the first time that you see something's not right or something doesn't appear the same as it always is, it's better to at least reach out and say, hey, I'm here to help you. I'm here to listen whenever you need it. Um, just doing everything that you can. Um, also, I wanted to point out, I did mention kids as young as five and six. And often when I'll do presentations with parents, they'll say that their kids have said to them, well, in my video games, when I die, I get to start over. So again, they're too young to realize the finality of what suicide is, but they're growing up with these resources and they're growing up with, well, not resources, but they're growing up with these opportunities to play these games where they're right. When they die, they do start over, but they're not realizing that real life doesn't work like that. So I hope I addressed that question. If I didn't, please feel free to add a follow-up into the Q&A box. Um, some of the threats, again, you'll see some of those written on there under thoughts. Um, and then in regards to situations, this could be getting in any type of trouble, whether it's at work, at school, with the law, um, uh, any type of struggles or troubles in their relationships. Recent losses is a big one. Something that a lot of suicides have in common is there was some type of recent loss. So it could be the loss of a loved one, the loss of an opportunity, a financial loss, um, the loss of a pet, the loss of a dream they had, whatever that loss is, it can be big, it can be small, it can make sense to you, maybe it doesn't make sense to you. If it's a loss to them, a loss of a relationship, that could definitely be a warning sign, a situation that you wanna look out for. If you know that somebody's going through some type of major change or they did just lose their job or they're retiring and they don't know what they're gonna do next, whatever that situation is, asking them how they feel about it. So not just assuming that, yay, they're retiring, they're gonna feel great now, they're gonna have all this time to do things, but really say, hey, I know this is a major life change, a major life adjustment. Other times when people have had gone through similar things, they've had these thoughts, let's talk about it. It's okay to talk about it if you're feeling a, a certain unease about it. Um, those changes in life, again, that feel very overwhelming is something to look out for. So maybe it's not a loss or a change that they brought upon themselves, but it was pushed kind of on them. That's something too, because anytime we're out of our routines or we have missed opportunities, um, this could be an athlete getting hurt and not being able to do their sport, play their sport anymore, which they spent so much time identifying with. That's something we want to look out for. Um, being exposed to the suicide or a death of a peer or a loved one is really a big thing to look out for. Um, we see this a lot with youth but we can definitely see it with adults as well. And a lot of times in those situations, you may hear the person say, I would do anything to be back with that person or I'll be back with that person soon. Um, so those are some things, some statements that we wanna be paying attention to. And then lastly, um, as far as some of the situations, if the person's being bullied, if they are the bully, if they have re recently um, been through some type of traumatic event, whether it was any type of abuse or they witnessed an event that they weren't expecting, um, they are struggling with some of those post-traumatic stress thoughts, that's something we wanna look out for as well. So again, if you know that somebody's gone through something troubling, just really being there as an extra person, um, not minding your business. I'll say that over and over, you do not have to mind your business when it comes to suicide and really reaching out and being there to help people however you can. Um, some things you can do when you're talking with somebody and some ways to help them. When we're talking with somebody who is expressing some of the warning signs we just talked about, you wanna make sure that you're picking a good time to talk with them. And you're picking a good time that's good for you and for them. Now with that, I'm not saying, oh, you seem to not be well, let's talk in two weeks. You never wanna wait that long. But maybe you have to go pick up your son from the bus stop because he's seven and him not being, him not being picked up will cause another problem. And saying, hey, I'm gonna go pick so-and-so up at the bus stop, I'll be back in five minutes, why don't you come over for tea? If you're working with a neighbor or someone like that. So again, picking a good time that's good for you and for them. 
picking a time that's private so that you're not having a conversation about um, their behaviors in front of everybody, picking a space that's comfortable for them, um, if possible, doing it face-to-face -face or at least over Zoom or some type of, being some type of, um, having some type of visual with them, being able to see them. Talking on the phone isn't bad, but you can always hopefully take it one step further. You also wanna be conversational. We don't want in this time to be blaming them for anything. We don't wanna just be listing all the things that you're seeing that they're doing wrong. Being conversational, letting them know, I'm seeing these things and I'm worried about you, but I wanna help you, let's talk about it. Um, something not to do as you're being conversational, not to make it about yourself, not to make it trying to one up them. Um, and by that, I mean, oh, you think you have it bad? Listen to the time this happened to me or, trying to say, I know exactly how you feel. Because yes, maybe you've had thoughts before, or maybe you've been in a similar situation, but we'll never fully know exactly how somebody feels. And in that moment, they need to be heard. They need to express how they're feeling. And they need to know that there's that comfort and care there with you to support them. You want to be honest. You want to make sure that you're not promising, thing, promising them things that you cannot do. Um, we can't solve every situation for them. We can't promise that everything's going to be the better tomorrow but you can say that you're willing to be there with them. You're willing to help them. You're willing to connect them with the resources that are available because you do wanna see them continue living. You do wanna see them feel better. And you wanna be direct. Um, when we talk about asking directly about suicide, and we'll talk more about it, you don't wanna kind of sidestep any of the issues. So you wanna be very direct in what you're saying, direct in what you're telling them you're able to do, and being direct and honest about what you're willing to do. You don't have to go out with a superhero cape on and save everyone. That's never what we're asking. You have to stay within your comfort zones. You have to stay within your boundaries. But again, you cannot just see somebody hurting and just kind of let them be. We have to intervene as early as possible. Um, when we're staying with the person, I always want to make sure that your physical safety and theirs are in play. Um, so if there is any type of weapon involved or you feel that your safety is at risk, um, Stay with them as much as possible, but if you have to leave, making sure that another resource is coming into play. So calling 911, calling the crisis resources that we'll talk about, making sure that you're not seeing somebody in distress and just leaving them. You are helping them, but you're keeping your own safety in mind. Um, regarding asking directly about suicide, this is because we never want to get a misleading answer from somebody. So if I were to say, oh, are you thinking of hurting or harming yourself? They may be telling the truth and they may say no because they don't see it as hurting themselves. So we wanna be very direct. If you're not comfortable asking the question, you can start with, are you thinking of hurting or harming yourself? But then you wanna take it one step further. Um, some examples, you could say, when other people have gone through retirement or when other people have gone through the loss of a pet, they've, had, um, they've experienced blank. Are you also experiencing it? Let's talk about it if you are. It's totally okay if you are. So trying to normalize the behaviors. Again, other times when somebody's torn their ACL and they've been out for the rest of the season, they've had thoughts of suicide. If you're having those thoughts, and this, again, this is based on what you're seeing in them, you wanna talk openly about it. Now I'm not saying just because somebody um, breaks a leg or something, all of a sudden they are having thoughts of suicide. I don't mean that in any way. I just mean that if in addition to a major life change, you're seeing them being withdrawn, you're seeing them have behavior and personality changes, you wanna step in and ask directly about it. Um, one of the statements you might hear somebody say is, I don't wanna be here anymore. And again, you can use that as a way to start the conversation, but you wanna take it one step further. I'm hearing you say you don't wanna be here anymore. Do you not wanna be in this session anymore? Do you not wanna be in this state anymore? Or do you not wanna be on earth anymore? Or do you not wanna be alive anymore? Tell me what here means. The more clear communication we can have with the person at risk, the better the whole situation will be and the better we'll be able to get them help and really have a good understanding of what they're experiencing and what they are um, thinking about at the moment. As far as um, listening, we wanna make sure that we're listening openly, non-judgmentally. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide as well, but really just being there as much as possible. I mentioned trying to not one-up them with your own stories, um, making sure that our body language is matching what we're saying, that we're not just nodding inappropriately and at inappropriate times. We're not trying to 
multitask as somebody's open up, opening up to us. So as hard as it might be sometimes, closing the email, putting the phones down, sitting with the person, being face-to-face -face with them. If they're sitting, sitting with them. If they're standing, see if they want you to walk with them, but really meeting them where they are. And then calling for help immediately. Again, um, sometimes a person might be too close to you to be the one to help them, or they might be a stranger and you're not able to stay with them. Calling one of those resources, whether it's 911, um, calling any of the crisis resources, a therapist office, somebody who can help that person in the immediate, because not everyone is trained to help in these situations, but at least you'll know if you see somebody in distress, how you may be able to help them. Some things not to do. We never want to keep it a secret. Um, we tell this to kids all the time that you would rather have a friend who's upset with you than a friend who's not here. So you do not need to keep it a secret. Um, but if you are going to tell somebody, I don't mean that you need to gossip about it, um, but making sure that the person at risk knows who you're telling. So making sure that you're saying to them, yes, I need to get you help. Here's who I'm going to talk to. Making sure that they're okay with the person. I'm asking them, is there somebody else that you trust that I can talk to that we can bring into this conversation? That will also help strengthen the relationship between you and that person and help strengthen that care and respect that they're feeling. Um, we never wanna sidestep the issue or treat it lightly, uh, especially if it's somebody who's younger. Um, you might have a child who says, oh, I am, I'm in seventh grade and I broke up with my boyfriend and my life is over. And you might be thinking, oh, there's going to be so many others. Don't worry about it. But to that child in that moment, that might be the worst thing that's happened to them. So making sure that we're not just sidestepping it. We're not just telling them to get over it and they'll bounce right back because we don't know that. Um, so making sure that we're taking every threat seriously, making sure that we're taking every issue seriously and sticking with them to get them the help that they need. It does say here to not leave the person alone, um, again, but keeping your own safety in mind. Um, we never want you to chase somebody down to try to save them, never do any type of physical um, reference with them or altercations, trying to stay verbally as much as possible and making sure um, that we are staying with them, but also keeping our safety in mind. Um, regarding simple solutions, Again, we don't wanna say get over it or you'll bounce back quickly or this will all be over soon for you. All of your problems will be solved because we don't know that. So making sure that we are letting them know that we're gonna help them the best that we can. We might not be the best help for them, but we're gonna find that person who might be. We never want to threaten them. We never want to judge them um, based on what they're saying. Again, their reasons for wanting to attempt or die by suicide might be so meaningless to you, but it could be everything to them. So making sure that we're not threatening them that if you do this, you're going to be leaving all your loved ones behind because they know that. They know that they have people, a lot of times they know that they have people that they will be leaving behind, but the pain that they're experiencing is just so great. So we want to make sure that we're not threatening them with, oh, well, who will help with this or who will help with that, but letting them see that there are people who care about them and it being in a non-threatening way. We never want to suggest drugs or alcohol to solve their problems or to have that conversation with alcohol involved because we want them to be as open-minded and clear-headed as possible when we do talk about this, these things with them. Um, some of you may be therapists, but we never want to try to be somebody's therapist in this moment. We want to make sure that we're connecting them with the appropriate resources. Now, again, that may be you. You may be working with a client and this is the situation that comes up. So if you are in a therapist role, continue obviously doing what you're doing. Um, but if you're not, you don't ever have to try to be somebody's therapist. You don't have to diagnose them or anything like that. We're just trying to connect them to the other resources that are out there. And Rosie, there's a question? Yes, Jen, there is a question um, from the audience. It says, do you have any tips for reaching your kids if they're struggling, but they're not willing to talk to you? Yes. Thank so with you. that, yep, no problem. So with that, being comfortable that your kids may not want to talk to you because often we don't want to feel like we're disappointing our parents. So it's not that we don't feel comfortable talking with them, but we may see this as a way of disappointing them. So a lot of time kids are more comfortable talking to a coach or a teacher or their friend's parents. So being okay with that, um, letting them know that you don't have to talk to me, but you have to talk to somebody. So letting them choose who that somebody is, but letting them know that 
you'll always be there for them. You'll always be somebody that they can talk to, but that you're okay with them not coming to you about it. Um, I know that might be difficult. I'm not a parent myself, so I don't know that relationship like that, but knowing that I'm okay with my child not opening to me about this, but I'm thankful that they're opening up to somebody and I'm thankful that that somebody's going to know how to get them the help that they need. And the more that we can do these type of presentations and get everybody on the same page, it helps build back that it takes a village mentality. So again, being okay with your child not talking to you directly, but encouraging them that they really should and need to talk to somebody. Um, often trying to change the conversation. So maybe you're not sitting them down at dinner and say, okay, let's talk about your emotions tonight, but maybe going on a walk after dinner or as you're washing the dishes or driving to soccer practice, just letting them know that you also have hard times and that's okay. And you're here to talk to them whenever they need it. So as a follow-up to that mm -hmm. question, um, Jen, what order should we seek help? Do you call their therapist, psychiatrist, the crisis line, 911? What is the protocol for that? So I think it really depends on the situation itself. Um, there's some people who will be talking openly about it, but as you're having the conversations with them, they don't express a want to do it immediately. They don't express any type of urgency. They're just kind of getting their toes wet in the sense of this is something they're starting to think about. Um, so I think it really, like I said, depends on the situation. In some cases, you'll want to call the mobile crisis or crisis line or 911 immediately because that person needs that immediate help, especially if they already have the access to their means or they're in the process of wanting to attempt or wanting to um, take their life. If the person's just, you feel comfortable that they're safe, they're having a conversation with you over coffee or tea, um, they just seem down, but they don't seem like they're an immediate threat to themselves. You can still call the crisis line just so that they have someone else to connect with. Um, if they do have a therapist suggesting that they call them and make another appointment or just let do like a check-in um, or helping them find a therapist to start going to. So it really depends on the immediate risk with them. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, I did want to talk about the language that we use when talking about suicide and hopefully that slide will pop up very shortly. Um, the language really matters. A lot of times, mental health in general, um, suicide, suicide prevention, suicide awareness, whenever we talk about it, it's very stigmatized. Um, I am hopeful that things will continue to get better, that we'll talk openly, more openly about things since we all have emotions, we're all feeling certain things. Um, more and more people, I think as more and more um, celebrities and athletes and people start openly talking about their own struggles. I hope that it encourages everyone else to do so. But the language that we use matter. So if somebody matters, so if somebody talks to you openly about their want to take their own life, trying to resist from saying, oh, that's crazy, or you're acting crazy or anything like that, because that stigmatizing language can be hurtful. That stigmatizing, stigmatizing language can close up that relationship and that bridge that you're building with them all together, close that gap. So we wanna make sure that we're not saying, you're not thinking of doing anything stupid, are you? Or you're not thinking of doing anything crazy, like I mentioned. Um, also, you're gonna hear more and more people saying died by suicide as opposed to committed suicide, because the term committed has a very negative um, connotation to it. When we think committed, we think crime or sin, um, and it often prevents people from getting help. So you'll hear um, died by suicide, suicided, but we're trying to move away from using the term committed suicide when we talk about it. Because again, the more we can destigmatize the language and the material, the more open people will hopefully be about expressing how they're feeling. And again, the earlier that we can encourage these conversations with young ones, the better it is all around. If we can say to kids as they're growing up from the time they're two or three, yeah, sometimes you just need to cry and that's okay. Or instead of saying, I didn't cry today, I was really brave. It's really brave to express those emotions. It's really brave to cry. It's really brave to say, you know, I had a really bad day, but tomorrow might be better. I'm gonna give it a shot. So just paying attention to the language that we use and trying to stop using any type of stigmatizing language such as committed or crazy um, and others that you might think of.
Um, and with the few minutes that we had left, I did wanna talk about the impacts of the current events that we are seeing. Um, I was very, I'm very proud of Delaware in the sense that, that our suicide rates tend to be always below the national average, which anything more than zero is too many, but we definitely work very well as a state, as a close knit community, trying to keep the numbers down as much as possible. Um, but as we all know, COVID's kind of unleashed this new beast that we don't know what's going to happen. Um, there's so much more unemployment now than ever before in the sense that people who felt secure all of a sudden maybe went to work on Monday and by Tuesday, their entire life changed. We're seeing businesses that people worked for for years crumbling. And I in no way am stressing that this is one blame or anything like that. Um, it's just a reality that's out there. And I mentioned loss earlier and loss being such a risk factor. There's so many losses that are impacted from COVID-19, whether it's the loss of relationships, losing loved ones, um, the loss of feeling, con feeling secure in your employment or your job choices. I was saying to my boss just the other day, it's sometimes hard to do these presentations and it's sometimes hard to be the one that people talk to about these thoughts because it's hard to always hold it together. So being okay to say when you're not okay. Um, we're seeing so many changes in the family, whether it's everyone being home together. We are unfortunately seeing a lot more traumatic home environment problems um, occur. We are seeing more um, domestic violence, child abuse come up. And those are things that are gonna have a lasting impact. Those are things that someone may not always be able to recover from, and it may spark some suicidal thoughts um, as they continue on. A challenge of virtual schooling in general. I don't think, yes, there are some kids who are thriving being virtual, but there's some kids who are missing that. There's some kids who are missing the fact that when they go to school, there's another person looking out for them. That there's somebody at school, whether it's a nurse or a teacher or the bus driver, there's somebody who's seeing that something else isn't right with this person. So we're losing that extra line of defense to get the person the help that they need. And just being together 24 seven can be a challenge in itself. Um, if you are in a household or you know someone who's in a household that's a very toxic environment, being there 24 seven, not having an escape, now that the weather's gonna get started, gonna start getting colder again, just some things to pay attention to. So if we know that somebody is living in this type of environment, or we know that they're struggling to work and parent and be a spouse or be a partner and do all these things at one time, letting them know that you are okay and they are okay, letting them know that we're literally all in this together and that none of us have to be the pincher's perfect person, that we're all just doing the best we can and that's okay. Um, also some impact that it's having on the essential personnel. Um, just hearing from nurses and doctors who had to make decisions about which person they were gonna get which treatments to and people who were missing out on their own families because they were spending time and having to stay at the hospitals and stay um, quarantined from their loved ones. It really does have an emotional um, toll on everyone. It has the emotional toll on the family. It has the emotional toll on the individual and just making those decisions that nobody ever expected to make. I mentioned loneliness earlier and I think that as much as we're all trying to stay connected, we're all starting to get that Zoom fatigue. So it's just a matter of what other ways can we stay connected to our loved ones, to our friends, to our neighbors? Um, really just looking out for everyone who's involved. We're also seeing a lot of um, impacts on mental health and suicides from a lot of the racial injustice that we're seeing. And a lot of times it's a general fear, and I'm not speaking on behalf of everyone, um, but it's a general fear. It's a like a gut punch, that moment that Am I going to be okay? Is my neighbor going to be okay? Um, some I know, like me, for example, I made a major life change during this COVID period and left where I was living and we moved just because of things that were happening. So it's definitely something to pay attention to. Um, and even a lot of the stress associated with the election, not knowing um, just the fights that are occurring, that there's not that general sense of connection. Um, you can't in this day and age, we can't disagree with everyone. Um, we can't disagree with anyone without feeling like there's gonna be a fight that breaks out. So there's more of that general fear. Um, I know a lot of my close friends and family members are feeling that. They're feeling that fatigue. They're feeling that burnout. They're just feeling like, when are things gonna get better? 
Um, so I did want to leave this part open for questions as well. Um, if somebody had a question and wanted to learn more about a specific thing. Um, but Rosie, I think there is another question that may have come through. Yes, there is, Jen. It's a specific question. Sure. I've heard of the CIT officers. Mm -hmm. um, if you have to call 911 because of suicide concerns, how can you get the CIT involved? And if you could explain CIT, that would be helpful. Yeah, so CIT is a program that is run through NAMI, which they, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, and they do a program that they work with police officers to do crisis intervention training and crisis intervention calls where they'll go out and help with um, any type of mental health call that there is. So I don't wanna to speak too much on it only because I don't wanna give out false information, but I can follow up with the right re with the connection at NAMI who knows more about it um, for this individual or for anyone who may be involved and in wanting to know more. Um, but I think that's something great that Delaware is trying to do trying to train all officers and trying to get more of these programs like CIT involved, um, even with veterans doing any type of veteran training so that um, if there is a call and you are a veteran or you are in a struggle, there's somebody who's coming to talk to you directly and you're not just another person, you're another person they can connect with. And Wonderful. I don't know if that really answered it, but I will follow up with the right resource for that. No, thank you, Jen. That actually is a perfect way to end because providing follow-up resources is going to be key. We will be providing follow-up resources for all of our participants in the summit. So thank you. Thank you so much for your exceptional presentation, for answering the, our questions. I know that if anyone has any additional questions, they can absolutely reach out to you directly. You're so accessible in the Mental Health Association is such an important resource for, for us in the community. Thank, thank you. you. Thank oh, you to everyone for participating um, this evening in our Wellness Summit. We hope that you'll join us tomorrow as the summit continues. Tomorrow's sessions include at 9 a.m. We'll hear about from Andrew from Minding Your Mind, his personal journey. At 10.30, consider doing yoga with Melissa Stanley from the JCC. At 2 p.m., we're gonna talk about coronaphobia, virus anxieties, and getting help again with Dr. Sheslow and Paul Sheslow from Jewish Family Services. And at 6 p.m., if you haven't had enough by then, we'll be doing a guided med meditation with Kathleen Perkins from the Siegel JCC. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful evening. I hope you do something that inspires you and brings you joy. Good night. Good night, Jen. Thank you, everyone.